if someone had put, had put a teddy bear in front of him, he would have said, well, teddy bear, you know, I'm really excited. I think you have a lot to contribute to this subject. I, I failed a qualifying exam in my first year of my PhD. The fact that, you know, my paper has been rejected for the 48th time is okay. You know, it's fine. <laughs> there are as many ways in which these have happened to me as, uh, as, you know, love stories on Netflix or something. And that just creates horrifying pressure on everyone else. Maybe that's one part of, of being at conferences that I don't miss. I don't know what we do. <laughs> I don't know what we do. Welcome to Math Life Balance. Today, our guest is Dhruv Rankanathan, who is a lecturer in Cambridge University, working in algebraic and tropical geometry. Welcome, Dhruv. I am excited to ask you about your Math Life Balance. Thanks very much. I, I've actually really enjoyed uh, watching these videos. So uh, yeah, it's, it's cool to be a part of one. Cool, thank you. So uh, tell us please about your background and what brought you into mathematics. What brought me into, yeah, I guess this is the kind of question one should probably think about before an interview. Um, I guess I, it just feels right. I, I guess I'm a person that does most things by feel rather than thinking it through. So, so it's always felt um, I mean, somehow physics and mathematics have always felt um, right for me. That's what I enjoy the most. But when I was younger, I, I mean, I wanted to do all sorts of other things. I mean, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be a professional cricket player for a good part of my life. And of course, that didn't work out. And then, uh, you know, there was some phase when I thought music would be a part of my life, but that also didn't work out. So, but I think maybe the science all came from wanting to build airplanes. That was, so I've fallen a long way from, from there. I really wanted to understand how, you, how, people, how people understand airplanes. And uh, that eventually led to physics and then eventually led to math. And then, you know, algebraic geometry was somewhere down the road. So as I learned from your webpage, you have, must have had a childhood, which is a dream childhood of many children, which is where you write that you grew up in South India and South Africa. Just like, wow, how, how <laughs> can you tell a little about it? Yeah, absolutely. That was, it was special. So, so my dad moved to South Africa when I must've been six. And um, it, when, he, when he first moved there, it wasn't clear how long he was going to stay. So he thought it was always two years, you know, in 96, we thought he'd come back in 98 and 98, we thought he'd come back in 2000. And it, it, he ended up living there for 20 years. And, um, and so I ended up spending three or four months a year, something like that in South Africa. And then the rest, of, so I was educated in India, but you know, skipped a lot of school and this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, no, it was amazing actually. Um, South Africa is a beautiful, beautiful country and it's very different and you know, when you have this kind of split, I, I've, I've had it my whole life, when you have this split, you know, the, when you spend your time in two different places, as you probably know, you can get away with being a foreigner in either one. And, and there's, there are a lot of advantages to this, you know, I can, uh, uh, you, you can, all, yeah, you always have the excuse of saying, well, I don't, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know about that, you know, I, I'm from India, or, you know, oh, you know, I wasn't around when that happened. <laughs> Yeah, so that was that was really um, that was really great. I think it helped a lot moving to the U.S. as well later on in my life uh, because I, I you know I knew how to be um, I knew how to be a foreigner, and I've been a foreigner my whole life uh, since my whole adult life. I've not 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 gone really. I'm not. I've not spent an extended period in India. I've never. Yep, and and so it's it's been. Uh, I think it, it, I've always enjoyed that that space, this kind of halfway. Um, really? So being an outsider doesn't bother you? No, I think I like it. I think I like it. You, you get a lot of, it, it, it's a lot of excuses, I think. <laughs> you get a lot of, you get out of a lot of things. And so all this moving around, so you've like lived in every, almost every continent. Yeah, I've hit four continents. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm waiting for them to open up a university in Antarctica and then I'll give that a go. <laughs> um, so I have a suggestion of a task for you. Um, I have a friend who cares a lot about diversity 
And in particular, she checks thoroughly whether there is enough diversity in my channel. And so far, I've been keeping up with her requests on yeah. you know, background diversity, but yeah. there is a little issue in that I think most of my interviews so far are algebraic geometers, <laughs> which <laughs> shows <laughs> my bias in mathematics. Uh, so uh, could you help me in um, convincing my audience that this bias is um, at least uh, can be justified by telling what is algebraic geometry and what are we as algebraic geometers doing? Now, what are we doing as algebraic geometers? You know, I think in some sense, uh, if you ignore the label, there's a huge amount of diversity in the people that you've interviewed, right? And I guess what I, what I mean is that we do a lot of things. <laughs> I think that shows itself in how people think about the subject, that, that people draw, maybe, maybe a good metric is the kinds of cartoons that people draw are extremely different. And maybe that's a better, you know, that, that's a better metric of how people are thinking is, you know, what, what, what's, what's drawn on their blackboards. Uh, when they're when they're doodling, don't look at mine. But, but that that picture is just always on my blackboard. There's nothing else but that picture, which my students will attest to. But uh, um, but would you like a question for an audience that's not mathematically specialized? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I go back and forth about this. I think maybe polynomial equations are just the right place where we can actually say something that they have just enough structure, geometric structure, that we can, we can have some hope as human beings to say something about them. And I think maybe the reason that the subject is so um, diverse uh, is that um, there's a, it's a confluence for, for a lot of different collections of ideas. And, and I mean, that's all we, I mean, that's all we do, right? We look for structure in that, that, that arises from algebra. We look for geometric structure that arises from algebra. And, and that's such as maybe, maybe it's the one thing we can actually do, right? I think most geometry is probably indescribable. But algebraic geometry, you have some chance. You, know, you, you, you can try something. You can solve a, you can solve a differential equation and say something, or you can, you, know, you can count the number of points and you can say something. You know, maybe that's the reason why, why, you, have so, why, why you have so many algebraic geometers on your channel. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with your bias. <laughs> yeah, I think you described it well. Uh, people always ask me what I'm doing and I try to give a five minute explanation and then people you know, usually fade after a minute and a half. But yeah. then once I was talking to a movie producer and he listened to all my math nonsense and he said, oh, so you study the shape behind numbers. And I was like, wow. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I mean, but you know, that's a funny thing, right? I don't think of it that way for myself at all. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think, yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why, I don't know why, I don't know what we do. <laughs> I don't know what we do. Uh, I, I think we just try and say something, you know, that's all. That's all. Uh, thank you for the answer. Um, so, as far as I've learned from your webpage, you've done lots of research with undergraduate students, which uh, I am very interested to learn about. So please tell as much as you can about how it works and how you and who comes up with problems and everything. <laughs> so my, my starting point for doing research with undergraduates is that I experienced it myself. So I, I worked with, with a person named uh, Dagan Karp in California when I was an undergraduate and he, he he's extremely optimistic. <laughs> I think that's the best way. Uh, the, that's the best way that I would describe him. Ma mathematically, he's extremely optimistic, and so uh, he thought, "Ah, what what should I get undergraduates to work on this summer?" He had just started. I think he must have been maybe thirty years old or something. He had just started, and so he thought, "Well, you know, my thesis was in Gromov Witten theory, and so I'm going to get these undergraduates to think about that too, right? Just no no sense of." Oh, you know, will you have the background for this? You know, will they be able to learn something? No. So I didn't know what an algebraic variety was. I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't know anything. And so I was sitting in his office, and he says, uh, "Okay, so 
know, let's just think about points on, on P1 and you know, how, you, how, you, how you think about points on the sphere moving around and, and, and you just tell some story. You just tell some story and then uh, within a half an hour conversation, he's convinced me that gromov witten theory is a very interesting subject. And, and more so, he's convinced me that, that I, can, I might actually be able to say something about it. And, and I, I don't think that was, a, I, I don't know, you know, I, I, sometimes I think back to that, that day and I think, you know, if, I, if, if someone had put, had put a teddy bear in front of him, he would have said, well, teddy bear, you know, I'm really excited. I think you have a lot to contribute to this subject. I don't think it was much different. <laughs> but, uh, but he was, he was amazing. And trying to replicate that experience for other people has been my motivation. And in, in terms of coming up with problems, I think, um, you know, I work in an area um, of algebraic geometry where there are not easy problems, but hard problems that have a low entry point, but a very high ceiling. And, and I think those are the kinds of questions that I always look for to, to, to work on with undergraduates. So they can actually try to say something. The, the, ideal, uh, you know, the ideal outcome is that they prove something new. But I think mainly what I try to do is give them an authentic experience of mathematical research. And you know, in, in terms of how to come up with problems, I don't know. But I, I'm thinking of, I tend to think about this basically daily. So, so almost every day I'm thinking about you know, what questions could I come up with to work on with an undergraduate, with someone who doesn't know what an algebraic variety is. And you know, over the course of a year, you come up with one or two problems and then you give them away <laughs> every summer. Um, I think uh, the one thing I will say is I think there is more, there are more questions that undergraduates actually can sink their teeth into than I think that there are more such questions than people think. We hide behind this Oh well, you know, you could never say anything about motivic homotopy theory because you you don't know anything. You don't even know what such and such is. You know, how can you possibly say anything new if you don't know what an infinity stack is? You know, that's that's not. I just don't believe that. And uh, and I think maybe that stubbornness eventually leads to to finding um, finding questions for them to work on. Um, okay, your answer sounds wonderful in some. Uh, imaginary world, sure. but it confuses me in the real world where I myself, as a postdoc, feel that I know not enough theory to like work on a research problem. Or I mean, that's a feeling I'm living with. Yeah. And then, so it's hard for me to convey that you believe undergrads don't need to know. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying that this is correct. <laughs> this like, is how does it work? <laughs> um, yeah. So how have I done it in the past? Um, I, I think it's fair to say that, a, a, that a, a, a decent amount of the work that I've done with undergraduates involves some kind of combinatorial or computational component. So they can do something, right? And they can get started. And I often use that period when they're trying to get started or trying to write some code or trying to do some examples, or draw some pictures as an excuse to teach them algebraic geometry. And, and I think from my own experience, I know that it's possible to teach them just enough to keep them from falling off the edge of the cliff, but not tell them everything they need to know. And, and, and I think that's okay. I'm very honest with them about what I'm doing. I'm very honest with them in saying, you know, there's a giant world out there that lots of people are interested in and you can contribute to it, but you may not understand the consequences of what you're doing fully. That'll take more time. That'll take more time than the research itself. And, um, yeah, that, that uh, yeah, so I think it, you know, if, if, you know, I think there are lots of questions in algebraic geometry where one can find some kind of combinatorial or computational piece to it. And then I think distilling that down to something where you use that as then an excuse to tell them about the beautiful mathematics uh, that, that is nearby that neighbors those, those ideas, I think is, is a reasonable strategy. I think other people have done this more effectively than, than, than me, but when you give them a problem, do you know a solution to it? Or no? no, no, never. I think what I try to do is do one non-trivial computation so that I know something, <laughs> that, there's, that, 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 that it's not completely impossible. So that's the stage I try to get it to. But I think it would be intellectually dishonest to give them a question that I know how to do. I have trouble 
sleeping with that. That's very cool. So this is like real research, not fake research. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, so I think almost every paper that I've written with an undergraduate, I think there are maybe five or six, I think has, has, has had some impact on, on algebraic geometry and, you know, not, 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 you know, not, uh, you know, not opened up a new field or anything, but I think there is at least two PhD theses of other people at other universities that, that um, build in an essential way on, on work that my undergraduates did really. And, you know, I don't know, I, I think I, I look for these things and I think maybe that's the real answer. I, I don't think there's a magic trick. I think you just have to, you have to, I think A, be willing to believe that such questions are out there. Uh, you know, questions that you care about that you can mentor a student through, but also that they have some chance of contributing uh, something. And uh, yeah, you, so I, I think that belief is, is maybe, maybe very important. But after that, I think you just, it's just hard work. It's, I mean, it's like any other research, right? That you have to... So research already is supposedly very hard. And aren't you adding extra difficulty to it by this restriction that uh, there should be like low entry? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you're consciously making your research and search for problems even harder than it is. Absolutely. Yes, yes. I mean, there's no reason for me to, yeah, if, if your question is, is there a reason for me to do this? No, there's no reason. I enjoy it because I, I'll tell you, my, my main motivation for continuing to try to do this is that, let's say someone in the second half of graduate school onwards, mathematics is great and it's wonderful and, and inspiring, but it also has a lot of other stuff, right? When, when you're a postdoc or a graduate student, you're thinking about jobs or publishing or you know uh, putting it in journal x y or z or or when you are as i've recently learned when one actually has a permanent position uh you worry about other things like you worry about your students for example um uh, but the undergraduates they don't have any of this right they are they're completely that you know they, they, they only want to do mathematics because that's what they want to do right and and I gain a lot from spending a summer or, or whatever uh, talking with them about mathematics because for them, it's just pure unbridled joy. That's the only reason. And that, that helps me remember that actually those are my reasons as well. And actually the fact that you know, my paper has been rejected for the 48th time is okay, you know, it's fine. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, think, I think that's maybe the main reason, that's my main motivation and also, you know, Good to, yeah, I, I, it's, it's one way in which I think I can contribute uh, something. I, I should also say, I don't think everyone needs to do this. Right? I don't think everyone should do this even. Uh, you know, I, I think lots of people contribute in our community in, in different ways. This is a way that I find, I think adds, maybe so, adds something positive. It sounds amazing. <laughs> They're great. Yeah, my, my students have been really great. I, I really, uh, I've gotten a lot out of uh, talking with them. Yeah. But um, so you mentioned this pure joy of mathematics and on the main page of your webpage, it's written that everyone can have joyful, meaningful and empowering mathematical experiences, which sounds great. But uh, unfortunately, at least in my experience, I guess for many other people, uh, there is a lot of pressure if, you, if mathematics is your job, as you mentioned just yeah. now, uh, which may affect this wonderful uh, joyful and empowering <laughs> experiences. So, um, what is the biggest pressure you feel as a mathematician? The answer to that question um, keeps changing. There's always something, right? There's always huge amount of pressure, and it just seems to keep changing every time one reason for pressure goes away, the next one appears. And and I remember, uh, I, I failed a qualifying exam in my first year of. Uh, of uh, my PhD, and that absolutely broke me, and and you know I had to recover from that, and I spent a long time you know trying to recover from that and rebuilding some kind of confidence, and then and then the pressure became oh I now I want to get my PhD and have a thesis and 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 then get a job, and so then now you start worrying about that, and then you know of course the postdoc was was extremely stressful for exactly that reason and. Um, yeah, I, I guess 
it, it's stressful because we want to keep it, right? That's that's the thing. It's very sad that the, the finiteness of resources means that there are there can only be so many professional mathematicians. That, that, that's a fact that makes me very sad because there are more people that want to do this than, than the world is able to support. You know, every time you have to put yourself out there and send a paper to a journal or, or apply for a grant, that can be quite a difficult experience. I, I've had rejections from journals literally 25 times. I, I would have thought that now there's no pressure, right? I thought, okay, maybe now, you know, now I have a job and it's fine, but, but, but of course there's still pressure because you still care about doing your job well, and then you still have, um, you know, there's a lot of judgment, right? The, the whole job, it, I think maybe because it's so competitive, there's a lot of judgment. People are always asked to comment on, is this deep mathematics? Is this, you know, important mathematics? Is this novel? Um, and you want to be, of course, all, many of us, most of us maybe want to be people who, who create mathematics that is deep and novel and all of that. And, and, uh, and th that comes with pressure, absolutely. And uh, that pressure is huge. Um, is there anything you believe the math community could do to uh, improve this or maybe some, some initiatives you would dream to have in your research group or something? Um, that's a great question. I don't know. I'm not, I don't consider myself to be a very scholarly person when it comes to how the world should work. I do think that from talking with friends and colleagues that we, uh, we form a lot of unnecessary lazy opinions that there's a lot of people that, that dismiss entire areas of mathematics as being unimportant or not interesting or, or you know, this kind of stuff. And of course, there are contexts in which we have to make those judgments, like when deciding how much of what grant money goes to what person or, or what paper gets published in, in the annals or whatever. Um, and, and while I, I admit that that maybe has to be done for practical reasons, I wish that we didn't carry those opinions when we didn't need to. And I think a lot of us do that, uh, you know, if you, if you're, you know, back in the days when we would have conferences, you would off, you'll often hear, especially as a postdoc, I remember hearing this, you know, people would talk about, oh, you know, so-and-so published a paper in the annals and so-and-so, you know, got a grant here. And that was, that was what the conversations were. And that just creates horrifying pressure on <laughs> everyone else. And that was such a toxic environment. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe that's one part of, of being at conferences that I don't miss. Um, it, it's cyclical, right? I mean, people decide what good mathematics is based on what gets ends up being published in the good journals or who gets the grants, and then then the grants and the and the grants are only given to the people who do that mathematics. And I mean, this is some kind of terrible system. So you know, I think maybe Dustin mentioned this in in his interview. I think he's absolutely correct. You know, we should just you know, abolish the publishing system <laughs> um, anyway. And, and if people want to form opinions about, you know, what's, you know, you can't stop people from forming opinions about what, from forming opinions. I think that's one thing, but I think lazy opinions and, and lazy opinions that affect the careers of young people, those we should avoid. And I think we should work harder to avoid those. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um... Again, from inspecting your webpage, I've uh, created a lazy opinion, <laughs> which I hope is correct, uh, that you have a lot of empathy, uh, which is uh, very kind of you. And well, in my opinion, uh, one of the few things our community lacks is empathy. And so let me ask you a few questions about it. Um, so for example, although you're right that Okay, it is subjective to decide which math is good or not so good, but nevertheless, uh, there are some objective factors in terms of productivity in mm -hmm. research. Like, I guess we all check out web pages of other colleagues and form some lazy opinions about that. And so, um, do you have any tricks about how to not feel, uh, so if, if it's like a spectrum, so how to not feel judgmental towards those who are maybe look less productive than yourself, yourself. Like you do tons of stuff as I learned and how to not feel envious to those who are maybe look even more productive than yourself. Um, 
I think we need to remember that, that there's much more than one can see. For some people, what, you, what we see from the outside as being really productive might mean that they, they it, it could mean that they love their mathematics and they, they are absolutely, you know, you know they, they are getting a huge amount of joy out of it. Or it might be because it's a coping mechanism and you don't know that. We don't know that. Maybe what helps with the jealousy is that, uh, is that we don't know. You don't know, we don't know the struggles that other people are going through, regardless of what, you know, how many papers are on archive that month. Uh, and I think that's a big part of it. What was the other half of the question? It was, how, how do we I, not judge? Uh, I mean, yeah, so how to have understanding for those who might uh, look as if they are unproductive or don't put effort. Oh, I, I don't think we should ever form the opinions that the opinion that someone doesn't put effort into it. Uh, you know, okay, maybe in certain cases when you know a person really well, it's clear that they're just on the beach or something. But you know, given that it's a career where uh, most people that get into it want to do it, if they are not being productive, it might be for loads of different reasons. I mean, how do you how do you tell a person to be empathetic, right? You you have to you have to put both shoes on, right? I mean, you have to if if you see someone who's who's not being you know who's yeah I, I don't know how to I don't know how to put it into words. There's um, I think there's just always more going on. A person's life is always much larger than than you can see, and um, and I think that's just that's just something we have to keep in mind. Perhaps what I try to convey is that sometimes. So I'm surrounded usually by amazing mathematicians who do tons of great work. And I wonder often whether they have understanding that other people may not be capable to do so much. Yeah. I, I remember I was visiting Brown as a graduate student um, in my third year. And there was a three week period where I must have slept, I don't know, maybe one or two hours a day on average. And every other hour, every other waking hour, I was I, I was thinking about math and I didn't want to. It was, tor it was it's torturous, right? It, it's, you cannot switch it off and you know you should and you know you, you just want to remove it from your brain and, and go to sleep <laughs> and, and you can't. And that, you know, of course, at the end of the day, if, you, if, if your brain is on for that long and you're, and you, and you're working towards a problem, you might you will find a solution and you'll write it up and it'll go on archive and what people will see is you know they'll see you know archive blah 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 they will not see you know three weeks of torture i personally don't know how to deal with that i've not i've never figured that out i think um but that type of memory for gives me a lot of empathy for people who find it difficult uh, but also because, you know, I also go through the other end where you know, I, I can't do anything but watch cartoons for, for, for five days in a row. And, and when, when I watch cartoons for five days in a row, I watch cartoons 18 hours a day for five days in a row, right? It's not, it's, it's, it's a little different. You know, there's no papers getting written there. <laughs> I guess many people can relate to that. <laughs> More than to not sleeping and yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe yeah, maybe that's uh, maybe that's more relatable. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. Sure. I saw that you also have lots of uh, collaborations um, and you do research in collaborations a lot. Mm -hmm. So a question that people ask me many times and I never know how to answer is how to start a collaboration. Um, you know, I, I'm sure it's the same way for you, but every one of my collaborations has a different story, right? It's like a different love story that happened in a completely different way. And, and there, are, there are as many ways in which these have happened to me as, uh, as you know, love stories on Netflix or something. Maybe not as many, but uh, um, I, I think some ways in which I've started collaborating, the ways that, that might be um, possible to replicate <laughs> are, um, uh, so, so one, one collaboration was just from, um, from someone coming to a talk of mine and asking me some questions afterwards. And I think many, many, many of those uh, start. I think, you know, for PhD students, I think, and, and maybe younger postdocs, 
I would certainly like this. It's tricky to, to go up to someone at a conference or after a talk and actually be willing to talk to them. And I would really encourage those you know, pe people in, that, in those spaces to go ahead and, and talk to people after, after their seminars because they want to hear from you, right? I mean, you, you, you work for years on this you know, little piece of mathematics and then you present it at the seminar and as the speaker, you want, you, you love it when anyone comes up and says anything. There's nothing worse than giving a talk and getting no questions or the obligatory question from, you know, the, uh, the, the person who's supposed to ask questions at your talk. Um, and, and so to younger folks, I would say, you know, go, go up to that speaker and, and tell them that you're interested and tell, you know, and, and ask them questions and, and ask them, you know, what seem like dumb questions to you. And, and they will go somewhere, right? They, it always goes somewhere, or it, it can, it could always go somewhere. So one thing I used to do as a postdoc was, um, so I hate being alone, mathematically and otherwise. I'm very, I get very lonely very quickly. And so the idea of writing a paper alone is just one of the most torturous uh, experiences I can imagine. Yes. Um, I, also, I also can't check typos for myself. Uh, so I can read something a hundred times that I've written and I will just not find, you know, the, the, the stupid typo in the first line. So often when I have ideas, uh, one of the first things I do is just, well, okay, not one of the first things. Once I know it's not completely uh, content free, I just email people who I think might be interested. <laughs> hey, do you want to help me figure this out? <laughs> so I think this is pretty good. Um, yeah. How about you? How do you do it? What is your answer to this question that people keep asking you? Um, well, my answer is that I don't know how to solve math problems myself. So when I'm encountered by one, I ask people who know how to solve math problems. And usually this, I mean, it starts with one person, but I hardly ever have collaborations with less than five people <laughs> in the end. <laughs> because, you know, during this process, there are more math problems I encounter in one project than when I ask more people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, in fact, uh, in Russia, when I was studying in Russia, there were more people writing papers on their own. And when I came to Germany and I saw that many people write papers yeah. in collaborations, my first judgment was that like, oh, perhaps they're not as good mathematicians. Oh, wow. I see. You fell down the judgment hole. Well, you know, in, my, in the culture where I grew up, there is a lot of judgment, that's normal, I'm sorry. But it took me just a little while to realize that it is so much more fun and so much more profitable to do things together. You learn so much, uh, even if you can write papers on your own. Uh, I think for many people, it's less fun. Yeah, when I was, I, I always have hated this. And, and, uh, but when I, was a, when I was a PhD student, my advisor made a deal with me. He said, you have to do this once. So my, my, there's two chapters of my thesis that are solo author papers, and I hate both of them. I, even now, I, I, I really dislike both of them. But he, he said, you know, I'm not going to let you graduate un unless, unless, you, <laughs> unless you do this once. And you only have to do it once, uh, but, but you have to do it once. And, and I think I'm happy with that. I, I, would, I would prefer not to ever do this again. Um, occasionally, and I end up having to just because you know, no one wants to try. <laughs> You know, it, it, it doesn't work if you just say, well, you know, I met, you know, I, I always want to have friends, but sometimes no one wants to be friends with you. So <laughs> you can't do it on your own. Right? So uh, yeah, may, maybe, maybe the point is that you have to be the kind of person that other people want to work with, <laughs> which, which is sometimes true for me, but not always. Yeah. <laughs> When I was writing up my thesis and making it into a paper, I would tell myself every minute that, please finish it. This is the last time you're doing it. I promise. <laughs> it. I swear you, I'm not going to yeah. make you do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> so far it works. Yeah. <laughs> I was um, wondering, since you have a lot of experience uh, in working with, with uh, students, I have a practical question for you. Many people realize early on that although they're studying math, they don't want to continue in academia, which is actually perhaps good for them uh, because they might have, you know, uh, 
lives with proper jobs and they don't have to move to weird towns in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so how to find motivation uh, to keep uh, working with uh, students who tell you explicitly that they don't plan to continue? Oh, uh, you mean from, from the end of the advisor? Mm -hmm. uh, I personally don't find any difficulty with motivation there. Uh, if a student, you know, if one of my PhD students told me on day one that that they would like to leave math after getting a PhD, then then I would say that there should be all the more reason to make sure that they have a authentic and positive experience that is reflective of, of, of what we do. I, I think the great thing about, about writing a PhD thesis, especially, is that there's at least there's probably one piece of original and correct mathematics that you can call your own. And I mean, beyond that, I mean, I mean, is there really such a difference? I, I mean, the, the jump from, you know, no original contributions to mathematics to one original contribution in mathematics is surely larger than the, than the jump from one to 75, right? So, so. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I, I, don't, don't you think so? The vast majority of people have, uh, have zero original contributions to mathematics. So. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to your uh, writing your own papers experience. So although you hated writing the papers on your own, do you think when looking back that this was useful for you or you'd rather not? My, my relationship with my PhD advisor is such that he, everything that he says is some kind of gospel to me. So he said it would be important. And so I believe it's important. Do I actually think it's important practically? I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 the, I, I, not, not practically. Practically, no. I don't think I learned anything from doing that. I, I think I just learned that I don't like doing it. <laughs> That's the only thing I learned. But, but he said that it would be a very important skill, and or it would be, you know, it would be important to do it once. And maybe, you know, maybe what that really means is that I had to do it once to add something to my self belief, because now I know. Okay, I can. If I really had to, I can't sit down and, 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 and write a paper on my own. Uh, and maybe that was important. But... So it helps with self-belief? Maybe, maybe. But you know, this is, this is just blind, you know, this is, uh, this is bordering on religion. So when it, when, when it comes to advice from my advisor, it, it, it basically borders on religion. He says something I basically follow. <laughs> <laughs> what is the best gospel you got from him? Maybe an important one. I, I remember having uh, having dinner with him once, and uh, we were talking about a mathematician who I won't name, but was a very kind of was very bright and uh, was extremely productive and was doing great work. And then made a mistake, and then spent five years or so trying to fix that mistake, and then eventually essentially lost his career to trying to fix that mistake. And we were talking about this and. I said something like, well, you know, you can, of course, it's very sad, but you can see how it happens, right? It eats you up when you make a mistake. And it's, it's so easy to, to, to get lost in it. He looks at me absolutely, you know, his whole tone changed in that moment. He looks at me and he says, you, you know, if you make a mistake, you, you, you know, you write a retraction, you put it on archive and you move on. And, and there's just, you know, it's okay to make a mistake, but don't, you know, don't lose your career to it. We all make mistakes. And I think that I've taken that I've tried to take quite seriously. Um, because I think making mistakes is, is a, that scares me. Uh, and, and I've done it despite that, right? So, so um, uh, it, yeah, it does scare me to, to the, the idea that you, know, you, you try to publish a paper and you publish a paper and then years later, it turns out it was all garbage. And, and that's a scary thought, but hearing someone who I looked up to tell me that, um, it's okay. I think that's something I, I try to absorb and, and, and try to remind myself of even now. Um, yeah. That's a good advice. I think, I think so. Yeah, all, all, the, all the good advice I can give comes from, uh, comes from other people, so. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe all good advice comes from other people. <laughs> There have been enough smart people in the previous yeah, yeah, exactly. life of humanity. <laughs> this is my belief as well. I, I'm not going to figure out anything uh, about life that they didn't know. <laughs> so related to that, I wanted to ask, um, since um, 
you also write uh, in the same source of information I have about you uh, on the main page of your webpage that every student deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. So let me ask you a stupid question. Isn't it obvious? That they should be? Yes. And if so, why do we keep writing and talking about it? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's extremely obvious that we should. It's it's also extremely obvious that we don't. Right. So so that's why we have to keep mentioning it. Does it help? You know. So so I think maybe one way that I might interpret your question is how does it help me to write on my own web page that I believe every student should be treated with 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 dignity. I'm trying to, rem of course, I'm trying to tell students that I, I believe this because I think it's important for them to know, but equally, I'm trying to remind myself that I believe this because we all fall below the standards that we set for ourselves all the time. And that's, that's just our nature. And I think, I think by, you know, by publicly stating this, I think it, it, it keeps us honest. Uh, and I think that's important because we, we, we fail, right? I mean, you, you say it's obvious that we should treat students with dignity and respect, but we fail constantly to do this in a million different, extremely creative ways. And, and uh, yeah. yeah, I think that's why, that's why that sentence is out there. So, um, can I ask one more stupid question on this subject? Um, perhaps I have a wrong impression, but uh, what surprises me in the last years is that, um, so in, in, in school, in high school, we used to read what, you know, smart folks in 19th century or 18th century would be writing. And yeah. the, in Russia, they would write like tons of intellectual ideas about how to change Russia and stuff. And then uh, I grew up and it looks to me like the world around the same kind of people who back in the days would be thinking about how to improve, you know, society and the world. Uh, so nowadays these people keep writing things that look obvious. We are fighting for obvious things. We keep talking about how everyone should be treated with dignity, how everyone should be understood, yeah. how everyone is valid and blah, blah, blah. Why, why is it happening this way? <laughs> I mean, why is it happening that we I think we're just imperfect beings and, and we're just trying to get over that. Right? We're trying to, I mean, people make compromises. Right? If you ask a person, um, do they think everyone should be treated in a certain way? Of course, they're probably going to say yes. But, but the hard decisions never come, you know, they're not there, right? It's not, should I treat you with respect or not? Right? That, that it's, it's not presented to you, at, you know, in the vacuum. It's just, I, I think it happens when people try to take shortcuts or people try to, you know, rationalize, you know, um, you know hiring someone they, they want to hire rather than, than someone else. It's too easy to, yeah. I, I think we make these secret little compromises in the back of our heads that we can't, we can't hear. And, and and I think it helps to say these things out loud because we don't remember them otherwise. Is there anything we be you believe we should do for increasing inclusivity in the community? Yeah, I, I think there's, some, there's something that's happening at the larger level. You know, there's something that's happening in the world right now. And then there's, what's, what, you know, there's something happening within mathematics. And Optimistically, I think the world is going in a, in a good direction for this, maybe at least in, in, uh, uh, in most places, maybe. Uh, and, and so I think we can benefit in at least in part by, by following, following in that route and just hold, you know, holding, holding on to the ambient progress. I think one thing that we, we, we could do is there's a generation of people now that that are living through our attempts to improve the situation regarding inclusivity and diversity in our community. 
And I think it would be great if we didn't then also create impossible work conditions for them with regards to being the people to include, you know, to, to improve the situation regarding diversity, right? And so practically, I mean, like, don't, you know, don't put, you know, young, you know, female or person of color lecturer on every, you know, every university committee you can think of, right? Maybe try not to do that. And, and maybe that's kind of a practical thing. Maybe the, the situation seems to be, I think, I don't know this, but I think the situation is improving statistically in terms of diversity and backgrounds of, of young people in mathematics, say, you know, uh, in the last 10 years, seems, seems like it's better, but it would be great if those people also had good careers and, and a supportive environment and actually enjoyed the job that they, they, they fought through hell to get. I think that would be really great. Thank you for saying this. <laughs> Let me ask you the last question. Uh, since I like fishing for advice, what would be your advice to young mathematicians? I don't know if I'm in any position to give advice to other people. Uh, I think maybe one, one specific thing that, that I, I find the need to tell colleagues who are slightly younger than me is that, uh, you know, they're, they're, I understand that it's, it's fun to be self-deprecating and it's fun to say things like, oh, I'm so stupid and oh, I don't know anything and this kind of thing. But I often find people you know, we'll, we'll, so here's a sample conversation that I, that I have maybe once a month or something. I'll tell somebody, uh, hey, that, I saw your paper on, on the archive. That looks really cool or it looks interesting. And they'll say, yeah, you know, it's, it's stupid. You know, oh, ah, yeah, who, nobody cares, this kind of thing. But, but I mean, okay, this is not literally true, but, but for most papers that, that, at least the people that, that I know, the most papers that they write, there's something in there, which means they learned something from doing this. And I think that's okay. You know, not everything has to, has to be you know, field medal worthy. And, and ultimately we're just recording things that we understand. And I think it's, it's okay to be proud of that. You know, it's okay to be proud of, of finishing a project and managing to write it up and putting it on archive and, and, and just, and, and having contributed something there's going to be enough reasons to doubt yourself from other people without you adding, you know, unnecessary ones on your own. Of course, all of us have, you know, I, I wake up every day feeling like a fraud, but on top of that, I don't need to get into the habit of telling myself that all of my papers are stupid or all of my ideas are worthless. And I find that it's too easy to get into that. And, and I, I, I think as, as easy as it is, we have to try not to. Um, it's so so hard for some people. Yeah, I know. I do it too, though. I mean, I tell all of my students not to do this, but then I do it, right? Oh, there's no there's no content in this paper. Everyone knew it, you know, in the 1940s or something. I do it too. I mean, I'm not a you know every piece of advice I give, I don't follow myself like everyone else. So, so, but, but I think that you know you you ask me for for what advice I would give a young mathematician. I think I'm a young mathematician. <laughs> I have to try and do it myself, but. Um, yeah, I, th I think we shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, we shouldn't call our own work stupid. How about that? That's just the baseline. <laughs> That's the baseline. Yeah. We can agree on that. Yeah. <laughs>